Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for everyone for coming. I'm really excited to have you guys here today. Um, we're also really excited to have both Van and Alan here today. Um, it's a really special event where we're able to get uh, members of two different admissions offices to come and talk to you guys about the college admissions process. Um, can everyone go back here? Are you okay, by the way? The, okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so for this talk today, we'll be talking in English for most of it. Um, towards the end, we'll also have a Q and A, and at that time, feel free to use any language you want. Well, maybe not any language, <laughs> Chinese and English. <laughs> um, and then you know, we'll be able to pass on the questions to uh, Alan and Dana as well. Uh, today, I'm going to be your host. I'm Andy. Uh, I'm the founder of Hano Education. <laughs> Thank you. <Andy. laughs> it's a very supportive brother. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so I won't talk to you about myself. The stars today are these two. Um, they want to introduce themselves real quick. Everyone, can you hear me okay? Cool. Um, so, hi, everyone. My name is Van. I went to UC Berkeley for my undergrad in ethnic studies. And after that, I, you know, was really curious about the college um, admission process and, like, you know, how do you admission officer evaluate So then I worked for the Stanford for about two uh, admission seasons. And then after that, I love to go to grad school and then Now I'm here. Nice to meet you. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Alan. Um, I graduated from Yale in 2011. And while I was there, I was an recruitment coordinator in the admissions office. Got very good. And so during that time, we you know, did a lot of interaction with students, with the uh, admission officers, and uh, lots of new programs like student ambassador, science ambassador, and the Yale Engineering South weekend. Um, since then, I've done a really important thing as well as uh, serving as a Alex, one of his greatest achievements was also helping me get into Yale um, back when I was a high school student. He said it's my greatest accomplishment. <laughs> it was difficult. <laughs> um, yeah, so we started. We also wanted to talk a little bit about um, our company kind of education. Um, I know there are quite a few familiar faces here, but also some new faces. Um, so, Panel Education, we really follow a idea called applying sideways. Um, I know those of you who have met us before have heard about this, uh, but for those of you guys who are new, we definitely recommend going to Google and MIT applying sideways. Um, this is an idea by the MIT mission. Uh, we really focus on helping students find their direction in life, find their passions, um, and helping them grow in that direction. So we try not to help students to you know, do things just to get into college, right? Um, ultimately, we want them to grow as people and as students. The Pano team in Taiwan is pretty big now. Um, so our team uh, has all graduated from top U.S. universities. Um, and so they're all very familiar with the college application process. And we also really want to bring them into Taiwan to be here full time working as teachers and teachers. So we think the relationship with the student is really important. I want to be mentoring like older brothers and older sisters. You know? So like what Alan did for me. Um, and so they're all here to help our students. Uh, besides though, we also have um, some very interesting resources that we brought to Taiwan. So we have a lot of U.S. professors that we work with. Um, a lot of students will talk to us about how they feel like they need research experience. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that in our case studies today. And so our professors are able to work with these students on a lot of uh, independent research projects. Uh, we also work with a lot of startup companies. Uh, similar to research, a lot of students also feel like they need internships, right? Um, and so we work on these internship programs for students to do a little bit more than just an afford copy for uh, the employer. Uh, and so we have a wide range of resources there. Besides that, we also work with a pretty large global team um, of also top grads. Um, and so these students are able, these teachers are able to teach students and subjects ranging from like AMC uh, to physics Olympiad, uh, basically any sort of thing that you would need. Uh, this was really important to me um, starting the company. Like growing up in the US, we had access to so many more resources in terms of finding professors to work with or finding uh, teachers in various competitions. So we really want to bring that into Taiwan. Through our teachers, our TV staff, and resources, last year we had uh, pretty good college admissions results. We had uh, Stanford admits, uh, Chicago, Brown, a lot of Berkeley admits. Um, actually, for Stanford, we had students in Stanford. Uh, one student every year for the last three years. So basically every year that we've been around, I'm very happy about that. Uh, thank you, Dan. <laughs> no, she actually wasn't responsible for that. Uh, so uh, before we get started, I did want to talk about a few different student case studies. Um, but we wanted to have 
Dan, first share a little bit about how Stanford rates their applicants, and then we'll also have Alan share how Zelle rates their applicants as well. Thank you, Andy, for the introduction. Um, so a little bit about Stanford, um, the way we review our applications. Um, we rate our students in these area um, with a scale from one to five, right? So one being the highest score possible and five is the lowest one. Um, and we actually view our application very holistically. So not only that, we know, similar to other school review the test score, um, SAT, ACT, AP score, and that kind of thing. But we also look at students' grade, um, and not just their score, but also their class grade. And the way that we measure this is through, let's say that a school offer AP curriculum, right? And if they offer 10 AP classes um, to all of their students, right, um, we will measure how many classes um, the applicant have taken. And that's the way that we measure the group. We also see if students also seek outside opportunity, whether or not they have taken classes at community college um, to really level up their academic ability. And we also look at the extracurricular activities, you know, what type of leadership role have they um, taken on, what award honors that they have, but also what competition related to their major that they have partaken. And then the last point, um, I think is really crucial to the Stanford application process. We actually really look for intellectual vitality. And intellectual vitality to us is whether or not a student is curious. Um, whether or not a student, you know, is truly, you know, staying up and late about a topic that they're curious about, about, are they taking on research opportunities? And then we also look for non-cognitive variables. So non-cognitive variable uh, at Stanford is, you know, who are you beyond your uh, academic ability, right? Are you a person that care about your community? Are you able to gain less outside of the classroom? Are you able to make meaning for, um, in your life? Are you able to, you know, plan for the long term and not the short term? That's the most important variable. We evaluate that through letter of recommendation, your essays. Um, yeah. yeah, so Ben mentioned that, you grade them from one through five. Tell us a little bit about like what's the you want to see for an accepted applicant. To yeah. for that. So generally, um, we accept students in the range of two minus to two um, in the overall um, grading that we give them. I want to share a little bit about the Yale admissions process, please. Yeah, of course. Thank you. So um, I think yeah. Dan covered a lot. You know, recognize a lot of similarities between how the ethics things. Most of the things like a lot of hot schools that have that kind of overlap. Um, one thing to point out is that Yale is a couple of four point scale. So, you know, one being instant on there, so it would be definitely not. Um, and then kind of the two and three range, but right? that's kind of where the agreement comes in. Generally, uh, I'm going to answer any of these questions on front. <laughs> um, two and two plus are uh, ideal if you're doing something that you shouldn't care. But then beyond that, I think lately because of our and volumes of applications and people understand the process a bit more too. Um, what I'll talk about is uh, what we really, how, how we can split the factors. How we split the factors. Oh, that's very better. <laughs> so um, the first point, this is kind of baseline. And so the way we look at the school is what's your transcript and kind of like Jenny said, is you're very healthy for that course. And then a little bit uh, kind of tangential to that is your VCs and your words and honors. And, I, and that goes with your candidate postal kind of area. It doesn't really give you really as much insight into who you're as a uh, So we kind of look at the left side and kind of compare sort of like hard factors. So you can't really change much of this by the time you look at This is stuff that's already set to And the stuff that you can't change a lot of this is who are you? How do you showcase who you are by yourself? And then so, a uh, huge component of that is teacher and possible recommendations. Um, supplemental recommendations generally are not that uh, helpful, right? Unless it's someone who knows you really well and can give you something beyond what you know, your teachers can do. Um, essay at Yale is extremely important. And I think uh, compared to other schools, Yale has a much stronger emphasis on the essay. Um, and lastly, supplemental material. This is kind of a trap sometimes because people will submit anything, uh, but you really only want to submit something that does give you uh, showcase a different side of yourself before it's something that I uh, yeah, really don't do. Yeah. So um, in terms of who are you, you know, these are the seven or so uh, primary categories that we think about. Uh, and so not only is this considered by the leaders and the officers, 
but also, you know, when you do interviews with some of these other factors that we ask in the universe to have with you. Um, I think they're pretty self explanatory, but I have a nice system for those of you who ask specific questions. Yeah, so I think uh, a couple of things you guys both brought up that was interesting. You know, people might have more questions about it, um, in particular, the letters of recommendations. Um, in terms of having a strong optional teacher letter recommendation, I'll, I'll take this answer to this question first. So, generally, when you think about uh, the recommendation, you want to showcase these tricks, right? You want someone who can speak to these elements. And so, uh, generally, someone really famous, for example, is probably not going to help. And like, this is a big trap that like, people fall into for these connections. Yeah, it should be someone you work with who can give detailed stories and examples. Uh, that pertains to these elements, and ideally also in an environment that your teacher and your counselor would not have known. So if you submit a supplemental recommendation that basically just says the same as your teacher recommendations, it's not really going to help you. Uh, so. so I mean that's actually a question that we get a lot as well. Um, we'll hear students with parents say, oh we know like the vice president of Taiwan, like can we get them to write a letter of right? Um, but basically you know if you have a working relationship then that would be great. But if it's just someone you met at dinner once, then it might not be very helpful. All right, thank you guys. Um, so now we uh, we set up aside four student case studies for everyone to take a look at. Um, I think with your uh, brochures, there should be a printout with all these case studies as well. Uh, I know the print might be a little bit small, um, and for those of you in the back, you might not be able to see this too clearly. Um, but you know, if you guys want to see more details, uh, feel free to come find us afterwards. I'm happy to talk more about them. So the first study, case study we have is our student MM. Uh, so this student, uh, he went to a local high school, a local private high school in Taipei. Um, his GPA was a 4.0 out of 4.0. Right? Uh, so his GPA is uh, did not go past 4.0 because they do not do weighted GPAs. Right? So the local school, they didn't have honors or AP courses. Uh, his SAT score was a 1520. So 720 on English and an 800 in math. A total score of 114 with no AP score. Um, so it was a little bit of a shame because this student decided relatively late to apply for the US. Uh, so he didn't have time to take any AP exams. Uh, he wanted to study biology and business. He had a few awards as well. So he had the Harvard Book Prize, which is a national award where one student gets selected from each school. Uh, he had a few different national level exams, uh, Taipei City NIR, and also a few speech contests. With an extracurriculars, um, I know this part's probably hard to read, but we can share more about it with you guys in detail later. Uh, he was the founding president of the biomedicine club at his high school. Uh, he also did a lot of research. Okay, so the two, three, and four here are all various research programs that he did. Um, he was also a participant in the Berkeley pre-college program. Um, he also did a lot of volunteering. So he was at a tri-service general hospital, uh, he also uh, worked in the Learn and Share program as a teacher and mentor. Um, yeah, so Ben and Alan, could you guys maybe share some highlights from this profile, things you like, things that you guys are noticing? Um, so yeah, I think the student generally has, you know, a pretty great GPA. Um, and again, this, you know, his test would not provide AP curriculum, um, so we would not hold that against him. So generally, you know, when your admission um, counselor, admission person read your application, um, they will have the context, you know, of your high school and, you know, your environment to be able to see, you know, they will understand that, oh, my first school did not provide AP curriculum, so they will not compare you to a student who's from a school that has AP courses, right? However, um, Annie did mention that he decided in a way that he wanted to pursue his college career in the U.S. Um, if he was to decide earlier, I would recommend him taking classes at community colleges that's available to him to really showcase that he um, is able to do the coursework at the college level. Um, and then we have some honors and awards here, right? However, Book Prize, National AP Exam Award. Um, while these awards are great, um, I think this is pretty standard for the pool that we see at Stanford. Yeah, and then I also really appreciate his research experience and how he's been volunteering in his community. Um, I think, you know, I think one thing that would strengthen his profile is if he had published research and then find ways to do that. So first of all, I agree with that 100% uh, on that. I think the other thing that I would, I would point out is you know, for a student like this, um, it's, 
He's done a lot of uh, good activities, but nothing that really stands out. So at least with jail, um, it's probably memorable. So once you get past the readers, you get to the community, your admissions office has to defend you and present your case. And so you're presenting a few thousand uh, series of goals. So how do you make yourself memorable? And so one of the things uh, to uh, so, um, so one of the things about Dill uh, in particular is uh, we have less of an emphasis on specific extracurriculars. So if you look at um, just kind of the list of items, right, uh, they're not going to spend a lot of time on that. So when I talk about something memorable, you know, publications are memorable, or like a long street of uh, competitions, things like that. And so it's someone, something that officer can point to and say, this is the person who has six six journals that they're kind uh, of um, publishing or they have three gold medals and uh, competitions and, and kind of things like that. But uh, just a long list of uh, UCs and they'll compared to other schools maybe uh, less uh, concerned about Yeah, I think they bring up a really good perspective, right? Um, of the students applying to Yale or Stanford, um, thousands and thousands, maybe 10,000 students have like perfect grades, perfect SATs. Um, probably all this summer internship of some kind or okay, some sort of research. So how do you stand out among all those thousands? It's like a real difficult question to answer. Um, I guess for this in particular, uh, one question that we do get sometimes is about his essays we score. So 720 on English and 800 in math. Uh, is the 1520 high enough? Do you need to aim for a 1580 or 1600? Um, what do you guys what's your take on that? I would say for Yale, that's definitely high enough. Um, Yale does publish kind of a medium range, so you'll see that it's actually the, the 25th percentile that is actually not at um, For many top schools, I think there's a stronger emphasis on having the whole student on um, a more holistic aspect than just the test scores. Um, I would say that it's very similar as answer at probably. Um, general look at our uh, profile very holistically, right? And at the same as a third person. And I'll also say, I don't think the last point is that as the we also look for you know, what we call point of excellence, right? So that is the thing that, you know, what makes you stand out. If I was to say a sentence or two about you, what is the thing about you that I would, you know, deem the way you like, that is a character of you? Thank you, guys. Do we want to look at the students' essays a little bit? Um, so you guys probably haven't had a chance to read the whole essay, um, but if there we could have been, I'll maybe quickly highlight uh, some of some points in the essay that you guys just listen to, and you can read the essay uh, a little bit later. Yeah, totally. So, um, so I think the student wrote a lot about his experience volunteering, right, and the people that he had met through his volunteering team. So, you know, the old man had him and how they have been influenced him, right, in a lot of ways to continue his journey to volunteer and help out the community. Um, I think this essay, you know, from reading it, the note I took down was, um, it showed me his ability to go to me, right, which is a character just like that we look for as answer, and the ability to gain non-traditional skills, right? He's making meaning out of his experiences, meeting these people through his volunteering experience. Um, however, um, I think I was a bit curious about how he wants to go about it, right? how he wants to go about volunteering in the future, which community is he trying to help out, what issue is he trying to solve, and I think that wasn't really clear through his essay. Now, have anything to add on? Uh, I think the one thing to add on would be, um, this is a very descriptive or a very tell, a telling essay. So what you kind of describe, I did these things, and I learned these things, but it has not really shown um, the, the growth or maybe kind of the next step as, uh, as, as she said as well. Um, I this. Yeah, um, this is something we talk a lot about with our students as well. You know, we want to make sure they're not just say their activity list, but with more words, right? We want to make sure that missions officers are learning a lot more about the student too. Um, yeah, so uh, this student, I'm, I'm, I'm still got to some great schools. Um, we got into Emory and University of Michigan, uh, so two very fantastic schools. Um, but now, as you guys were listening to the profile, I'm sure some of you were thinking about if I were a Stanford admissions officer or a Yale admissions officer, what would I rate the student? Right? Um, I don't know if Van and Ellen, could you guys can reveal how you would rate this particular student? I think, you know, based off of everything that we said, and I would probably put the students at a three, um, maybe a three plus, depending on the context. 
Uh, but I think, you know, we have a very competitive school applicants, and I don't think I'm going to put students to it. Yeah, I think similarly, as Amber, I definitely gives this student a three, a solid three. Um, however, there was no clear intellectual vitality that uh, vitality that I was able to identify. So I couldn't give a higher rating. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let's take a look at our second case study, ML. So ML is a little bit different. Um, he actually went to an American school in Taiwan. Uh, his GPA was a 4.14 out of 4.0, it's rated. SAT score was a little bit lower. Uh, he had a 700 on the English and a 790 on math. Uh, AP score, so he went to an American school, so he had the AP curriculum. Uh, he took quite a few APs. Uh, most of them were fours with two fives. Uh, he was planning to study business slash social science. He had dual citizenship, right, USA and Taiwan. And then with the honors and works, uh, he had some publication. Right? So he had two publications, basically. Uh, he was a debate champion for World Scholar Cup. And then he had just a few more smaller regional awards as well. With his activities, um, his first activity was an internship at a fintech company called Fun Park. Uh, his second activity was an organization that he founded himself. Uh, they made environmentally friendly accessories. So pretty cool. And then he had, of course, his research. He was a swimmer, a captain of the varsity swimming team, and various other leadership positions as well down here. Um, so yeah, he did quite a few different activities. Um, what do you guys think? So for me, compared to the previous student, I needed to find impressions this is from the student. Um, there's a publication, there's a consistent, uh, competition level of uh, achievement. Um, what actually stood out more so than even that, and for me, is on the next page. Um, the students showed a lot of initiative. Right? So they founded a company, they founded these groups, uh, they were listed as a co author. And so it becomes a lot easier to build a case of the student or to describe the student uh, because of these activities. And there is no memorable that stands out. Uh, yeah, Ben, what do you think? Yeah. Um, I I definitely agree. Um, I think, you know, the publication was great. Um, also, like, you know, creating his own company, I think that's really show from the trip to be able to do that. Um, and also the students say, um, you know, definitely care a lot about the environment and, and his community, right? Through all of these, you know, um, summer camp and, you know, developing technology and eco-friendly products. Yeah, so a couple of questions I have for you guys. Um, so for a student like this with AP scores of fours, um, what do you guys think about the maybe score for it? Like, is that acceptable? You know, a lot of us are overachievers here. You know, we all want fives. <laughs> um, but is a four okay? Yeah, um, I think at Stanford, a uh, score of four is definitely acceptable, right? On your profile, um, the school might or might not accept them, you know, as credit when you get admitted. But, you know, a score of four is still a great score for you and really show your ability to take all the other courses. Sounds good. Um, and what about for you? Is it about the same? Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, if you think about back to kind of the two, like, two factors that we think about, um, Yale uh, first considers can you do the coursework, right? And so a score of four does show that. And then beyond that, I think mean, it becomes more about the rest of that. And I guess just another question about SAT score. You know, we always think something that starts with a 15 just looks a lot better. Uh, do you think that there's a significant difference, the 1490 versus anything the 1500? Uh, for me, I think obviously 1490 compared to like, let's say even 1540, 1550, uh, it's not a huge difference. I think they have shown academic capability. It shows that they have uh, the competency there and beyond that, I'm not too worried. Got it. Um, yeah, one thing that I thought was really interesting that they offered to elaborate on as well, and something that we really encourage is trying to do more in your community um, beyond just focusing on yourself. Right, so um, in the first year, maybe a lot more of this activity would focus on things that he individually did. Uh, but this student definitely did a lot more for the environment uh, and for the rest of the community as well. So uh, always good to try to expand the scope of your activity too. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at uh, his personal statement. Um, any thoughts? Yeah, so I think the students definitely have a book here, right? Is it just a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? So I think as admission reader, we often get tons of essays, right? And I always advise our students to, you know, write some, um, you know, have a book, you know, make me curious about what you were going to talk about. And I am definitely curious about what the student is talking about. So after reading the essay, you know, the students definitely, um, she basically um, compared 
for multidisciplinary interests in tech, finance, and ecology to a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And she also talked a lot about what she has um, done using her finance um, interests to help out the women in her community. So I think this student um, really showed the ability to navigate different systems, um, has a really positive self concept She definitely knows what she's talking about and who she is. Um, and then she also has, you know, successful community engagement experience. I think overall, um, you know, really strong student. However, I think um, similar to what we mentioned earlier, I think she talked, um, she, you know, did a lot of telling of what she had done, but not very uh, much about showing us who she truly is, right? She's telling us that she's interested in finance, but, you know, I want her to show me how she's interested in finance. Um, yeah, I think the hook is really good. One thing that struck me with this essay was it really felt like she tried to fit too much into the hook. She tried to mold her story into the hook. And so if you look at the way she tells the story, it doesn't necessarily uh, blend as well. And so um, it feels a little bit more forced. Uh, it feels like if we think about the, the personal qualities or who, who you are that we have uh, you know, the seven qualities, um, it doesn't give me a strong sense that she can express herself or express her needs um, in that sense. It, it does speak well for her that she is so strongly involved in her community. She's taking kind of the passion for social and for business and you know, doing uh, a strong application of that. But from my essay standpoint, uh, I think this, you know, it started strong and then I think the execution could have been better. Yeah, so for those of you who are maybe 11th graders now and starting to look into the application process, the essays are definitely a major part. Uh, we can sort of see how both of them are paying a lot of attention in the writing. So it could be a good time to get started soon if you haven't started thinking about it. Um, so this student in the end got into UC Berkeley. Right? So a fantastic school. Ben, yay, Ben. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the scores that you guys would have given this student, what do you guys think overall? I think I give the student a three plus overall. I think definitely stronger profile, but I wish to see more of her, um, you know, intellectual vitality in her essays. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. I think stronger than previous student, but not a clear winner. Um, so I would also do a three plus. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, so for the next student, uh, before we getting closer to the twos, uh, the next student we actually do have a student who got into Stanford. Uh, are. And so we can maybe take a look at his profile and see you know, what he did really well so that maybe we can emulate some of that as well. Um, so for this student R, also went to an American school in Taiwan. Uh, very high GPA, so 4.57 out of 4.8. Um, both of them mentioned that the GPA does matter in terms of your context as well, right? So this student at his high school was you know, one of the top students. Uh, his SAT score was also a little bit higher. Uh, 750 on English and 800 on math, also 35 on the ACT. Uh, and then his AP were basically all five. Right? So great AP scores. Uh, he applied as a science technology society major at Stanford. Um, no US citizenship, but then he also had very, very strong awards and honors. Right? So he qualified for the US AMO. Uh, he had an AMC score of about 116 and an AME score, AME score 13 out of 15. So very, very high. Um, he was an Eagle Scout, which is nice. Um, there's not many Eagle Scouts in Taiwan, I believe. Uh, he was also a physics competition gold medalist uh, and also quite good at the saxophone. A little bit of music in there. In terms of his activities, um, he started off with an independent project that he started on his own, where he was able to write an algorithm to help farmers uh, see defects in their fruit, right, to help them you know, sell fruit better. Uh, for number two, you know, he, had a leader. he was a troop leader for the Boy Scouts. Uh, he was president of the computer science team. Uh, and one thing for the computer science team that he did was he also helped uh, make websites for a lot of nonprofits and charities. So we were able to help him expand the scope of his activity a little bit. Uh, he also attended the Launch X Entrepreneurship Camp in the summer, which is an MIT program. Uh, and then he had, of course, physics team, math team. He had an internship at a large tech company. Uh, and then also just various math camps at the bottom too. Um, so obviously a very strong candidate. Um, yeah, Ben, what do you think? Yeah, um, I think, yeah, definitely a really strong student with like, you know, really strong academic profile, you know, all of the five in his APs. 
Um, and also, he has taken the courses as related to his major. I think at Stanford, we do we do that, right? If you say that you're interested in science and technology and society, are you taking courses related to these um, to these subjects? And then also, um, you know, he has an 800 in math and also qualified for the USAMO. Um, so at Stanford, we call these students math star. So that will guarantee them a second week, right? Um, and then he also had, you know, participated in national competitions in STEM. Um, I think one thing I want to point out is that the student also has an interest in music, right? Which shows me that he's more than just a STEM student, right? He has interest outside of STEM, right? And computer science, so he's a little bit more about that's what, um, you know, his accomplishment is coming. And then I think um, with his, you know, a, achievement, the independent project is really telling me that the student is really extremely curious, right? Like he's taking time outside of his classroom, outside of, you know, no one is giving him a grade for this, but he's taking his time and energy out to solve this problem for learners. Um, you know, being leaders in his physics team, math team, but also using these skills to, um, help out more people in this community. And I think that's really um, what we look for in our students. So when I look at the student, I think uh, the first impression is a much stronger impression because you look at uh, the math competition scores, those are extremely high scores. Um, you follow that up with the physical, uh, with the physics competition uh, win. And so, you know, you, you see the student has put a lot of focus um, in, into, into those elements. Uh, and because of that, you know, uh, when you apply to some of the top schools, they really don't want to be mentioned students. So as Dan said, you know, have seen uh, high, high participation and high accomplishment and music is really helpful as well, especially because if you see the way it's laid out, it's essentially you know, two, two major uh, elements in the awards and honors, right? So STEM and music. And so that really helps to solidify the story of the student, who the, stuff, who the student is. Um, one thing that I want to point out in addition is uh, you'll notice that the independent project is not something crazy. Right? It's not like genetics or stem cell or cancer research or anything like that. It's something to help learners. And so one thing I want to point out is it's not necessarily the complexity or like you know how technologically advanced uh, the research is, but what you do with that research. So this person really dove deep with that, right? you can tell they really understood the work that they were um, doing. And I think the other thing that Van touched on too is not only did they, uh, are they passionate about this, these topics, but they really exerted that force outwards, right? So they went and they taught other students, they did these other community-based activities that helped to expand that. Uh, yeah, so regarding the independent project as well, I think both of them, both the student and the previous student have mentioned it as being very important. Um, in terms of like when to do it, uh, I would also want to emphasize the summers, right? So for uh, the summers are when students have the most time, um, they don't have school. Uh, so I think a lot of admissions offices, they don't want to see that students are just hanging around at home, playing video games or you know, shopping, right? They want to see that they're actually spending their time and energy doing something meaningful uh, for the community. Um, I have questions for Dan and Alan. Uh, so I think for both uh, this student and the previous, they've had sort of something outside of academics, right? So this student had a saxophone and the previous student had a swim team. Um, can you talk a little bit about how those factor in in terms of the application? So for you, I would say it's more the fact that you have them and you have committed the time and interest, right? So it doesn't matter what that specific uh, activity is, as long as it is something that you're interested in. So maybe let's say you're a swimming prodigy for whatever reason, and in your, in your senior year, you win and won a bunch of gold medals, but you've never swam before, you didn't participate in that team activity, then that looks less good than someone who maybe has not won something, but had done a lot of swimming activities. They coach swimming, they went to community centers, they volunteered at swim clubs. That person uh, to Yale is much more impressive than someone who like, was naturally born really good at swimming and then went and got uh, that much gold medals. I think at Stanford, we, we really love a all friendly student, right? We love students who are interested in multiple things, right? And have, you know, have put their time and energy in it, right? Um, so I would recommend students who really do four years activity, right? I think we, you know, when we see that on your resume, we really put that note down, like, oh, hey, like you have, the student has done basketball for the past four years. And yeah, even though it's not related to your major, it's also me you know how to manage your, your time. Right. So I think these are also really important. Yeah. And how about like the music portfolio? How does the admissions process use that? Um, so at Stanford, unless you're applying um, 
you know, for you know, music major or dance major, you also um, can submit uh, an art portfolio. And normally, you know, as someone who doesn't play any music, um, I don't review those things as a mission counselor, actually. So we'll have our professor to re um, review those portfolios and they'll give a rating of one to five as well, right? So let's say that they give Andy a two in dancing. Uh, so then that means that this extracurricular rating will automatically go to a two, right? But that doesn't mean that, you know, you often have a you because we also need to evaluate on the factor. And that's that's the same for sport, right? If they wanted to recruit Andy for volleyball and the coach really wants him, they will give him a one and, um, you know, on the letter that they will give, give them to us. And then we'll give him an extracurricular score of one. Right, um, but that also doesn't mean that we'll admit the student. Uh, first, I just want to say Andy's dancing is a one, not a two. <laughs> <laughs> one out of ten. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I I would agree. I think when we look at supplementary materials, especially like arts or science publications, you know, it's it really depends on uh, the level. Of, it just shows a level of commitment. I think. And so, as a reader or as a first, as a as an officer, it doesn't. Necessarily sway one way or the other, but idea what we'll do is we'll invite like an art professor or music professor uh, to, to also come uh, listen or, or uh, review it, and they'll make a decision on well, is this something that would give you some extra consideration? Sports is a little bit different because outside of uh, being recruited for sports, um, you probably won't have like supplementary materials that are given to you. So if you want to be uh, Acknowledge or review for your uh, athletic abilities, you would want to be scouted by the coach or have um, some ways to send your materials to the coach beforehand. So the coach will put you on a list and say, I want this person to go for yeah, And One thing I think I heard you talking about was also the consistency, right? Like Alan mentioned, even if you're not the greatest swimmer in the country, you know, if you do consistently you contribute to the community, it can still help a lot. Um, so for a lot of our younger students, you know, it's a good time to start thinking about what are some long term things you guys can do. Um, I think in an extreme case, one of my classmates back in high school, he started like three clubs senior year. Um, so it was like a month before application season. And at that point, anything you do, you know, it doesn't add as much value anymore. So being able to find your interests early and you know, start those passion projects uh, really makes a big difference. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was also the majors uh, that the student made. Um, so this student went for science, technology, and society. Uh, but based off of his profile, a lot of you guys might be thinking, he seems like a pretty good computer science student, right? Um, why didn't he just go for computer science? So I wanted to ask maybe then Alan to share a little bit of perspective on how the major selection works or how it affects the applications. So at Yale, actually, generally, the major selection doesn't matter as much because Yale's focus is uh, generally around building community and building leaders. So um, but one thing that a lot of people don't know about is that Yale, you're actually not locked into a major until your junior year. So at the end of your sophomore year, that's when you have to choose a major, and people frequently will change majors up until that point. And then even after that, people will still change majors. So your declared major generally doesn't make a big difference. However, if you're uh, like a clear star, like this person, uh, I think math star, right? Um, they want to see that you your, your your interest is pretty genuine, right? So I wouldn't say it's a big boost, but it would help to declare your major more STEM oriented to start with. Uh, because for a school like Yale, where we don't, we're not known for STEM, right? Then, you know, why, why are you coming here, right, for example? So we want to understand like what that, what that reason is and you know, how you kind of carry that passion out. So if you come and you declare like a math major, like this person is going to Yale, then I would expect somewhere else in your application uh, a way for me to understand, well, why do you want to do Yale and not MIT? Right? I think at Stanford is a little bit different. Um, so at Stanford, the intended major that you're, you're applying as is actually the lens that I'll put on to review your profile, right? So the students say that he's interested in science, technology, and society, then that would be the lens that I'm going to look at, right? Are you involved in science, technology, and society outside of the classroom, right? How are you exploring your interests? Um, you know, in society, what exactly are you um, curious about, right? So that's the lens. Um, so I will also say that, you know, at Stanford, I think, you know, a lot of students apply as STEM. A lot of people want to study computer science at Stanford, right? And there's, you know, a typical, some typical major like biology or, you know, economics, political science. So those um, majors are pretty saturated, 
right? And so then, then, then we have majors like Latin, classics, um, gender and women's studies, right? Asian American study that no one is really saying that they want to study, right? So from a, you know, from an admission perspective, I actually want students in all of my major, right? So um, I think, you know, really encourage students to explore all the majors at Stanford as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, so piggybacking off of that, um, you know, one question that I get a lot is also, uh, should I just pick a really random major? Right? Like maybe this student, a lot of computer science classes, but maybe he just wants to study women's studies, right? Um, is that going to be okay? Um, I think going back to the whole consistency issue and I would bring up like, why do you want to study this? It raises serious questions about why do you only do computer science activities, right? Um, so we generally think, you know, if you're going to apply for a particular major, you still want activities to back it up to show, like Alan said, that your interest is really genuine. Um, that being said, um, going for a major like computer science is still uh, pretty tough. Um, there's thousands and thousands of you know, really strong STEM kids. Uh, I think specifically also Asian STEM guys, right? <laughs> and Asian STEM girls, right? Or Asian STEM people in general, <laughs> especially in Taiwan. Uh, so to stand out from that, it could help to have a much more specific major as well. Right? It's like this student chose, despite having such a strong profile, right? He's still very nervous about doing the computer science. He went for science, technology, and society, which uh, goes in well with the CS as well as all the service that he did. Right? Um, other students we've had, you know, who have been interested in computer science, who are very strong to think about secondary majors as well. Right? So a student who's interested in learning Japanese, you might say you could combine both of them, right? And you like computational linguistics. Um, so just a little bit different to stand out a bit more. Yeah, there's also computational biology as well for students who are interested in this. Computational chemistry, computational, there's a lot of computational stuff out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about this student. Um, why don't we go ahead and look at their essays a little bit? Um, we did something a little bit different for this student um, because they did get into Stanford. We wanted to go through it and look at the Stanford supplements actually. Uh, so you guys can take a look at that. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, so, you know, I think I get really excited about supplements because I think people don't talk about supplements essays enough, and that's actually where we get most of our, um, you know, ability to identify their intellectual curiosity and their non cognitive variables, right? So I'll go through a few of them and I'll give example. So here I say, what is the most significant challenge that society faces today, right? So a lot of students worry about climate change or racism and sexism, right? Which is, you know, a really strong topic, but you have to be able to articulate yourself really well. And this student wrote about toxic competition and social relationship, right? And then talking about the struggle that immigrants face, right? I think that is a really strong example of, oh, actually the students have thought about these things in our society and have, were able to articulate the system that continue to um, create these ideas, right? And then how did you spend your last two summer? You know, he didn't just talk about what he did, you know, and he had already shown us that through his activity list. But he told us, you know, he learned lifeguarding for say certification, he jogged every day, you know, let me know a little bit about the student who he is outside of the classroom. Uh, and then historical moment, I think this is where I got his ID for the society part of his major. Right, he's talking about he wanting to witness the patriot fighting against the repressive chain regime, right? So he's curious about history, right? Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to be so specific. And then um, I think we're going to talk about this one. So at Stanford, we ask our students to write a letter to their um, future roommates, right? And I think you know a lot of people are like, okay, like what are you looking for exactly? Um, but I think it's not just, hey, like, you know, I, I like to be in a room or whatever, but the student actually tell us, hey, I'm, you know, I might seem like a STEM person, but I'm interested in a lot more things. Right? I'm interested in art. I'm interested in going to the Anderson Collection on campus to look at art. You know, he had done research on campus. He know where he'll study, right? You can find me at the Green Library studying, right? Um, you know, I'll talk about, you know, quantum mechanics and physics. So all of these things really tell me that this, the student is genuine about STEM, right? But also know exactly why Stanford and who he is outside of the classroom. Now, before Alan goes, I do want to say uh, when Alan applied for college, he got to Stanford as well. Uh, so he's written versions of these essays that were very good. I'm not sure we should review this. 
Um, I think Dan did a really good job of covering, um, you know, I will speak about Stanford specifically, but Yale also has kind of short answers along these same lines. So I'll just talk about uh, what I really like about these. And, you know, if a similar question comes up for Yale, you know, what, uh, what an officer might, might think about. So the first one I thought was a really good example of orthogonal thinking. So as Dan said, most people will think about and identify you know, the very large scale problems, but this is a, a problem that is sort of underlying society and pervasive, and it actually feels pretty personal. You know, especially um, you know, at a competitive high school doing competitive college missions, it can feel like everything's very zero sum. So not only do I like that they, they're thinking at this level, but also that they're able to express uh, their thoughts so succinctly and clearly in basically 50 words. Uh, so that was really impressive. Um, on, on the topic of the last two summers, uh, I actually really liked as well that you know, they talked about what they got out of it, which is lifeguarding uh, at first aid. And actually the, the next one where they said jog every day, uh, I thought that was, that showed a lot of character, right? That's something that most people would not think about, but this person clearly took a lot of pride in that. So when a question like this is answered, it gives uh, the officer an opportunity to see what, what matters to you. And what matters to this person is that they jog every day. And they did these other things, but they also jogged every day. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, in terms of the historical moment, I think Van covered everything about that. I think uh, the level of detail, the specificity show that it's not just kind of like a, I'm just throwing this on the paper to show that I'm not a one trick pony. Um, and in terms of uh, the, the last one, you know, whether it's friends or alone, running gives me time to meditate. This actually ties back to the previous question, where they jogged every day. So uh, these short answers do a really good job of creating a whole picture of the person. Uh, and each, I would say, each answer uh, reinforces the previous answers, which is really nice. Um, the, root, the Rumi essay, I think this one actually just really blew me away because it showed a lot of who this person is. There's a lot of personality that you can see in it. Um, as Van said, it's very specific about the campus elements, which means that the student did a lot of research and understands the campus. Uh, and they're actually not afraid to kind of um, reveal some maybe more negative points, right? You know, I might have a rescue voice, uh, I'm a bit of a neat freak, uh, maybe you know, we can do these things. So being able to do that is, is actually really nice because you want someone who can uh, relate to uh, their, their peers, right? Not just someone who's uh, very intense. And I would imagine that the tone of this essay is also very different compared to the personal statement, uh, which I think would be a really nice contrast. Yeah, we really want to showcase these essays also because I know a lot of students and parents might think the personal statement is the number one most important essay in the application. And you know, some of these are only 50 words, like they're not that important, we'll just write something down. Um, but I think it's pretty clear, you know, from hearing what they're saying, even 50 words is a great opportunity to showcase something special about you. Um, I'm really happy to hear that because, you know, even on these essays, we spent a ton of time working with the student. Uh, he had raised him a lot of drafts just to come up with the right ideas. So I appreciate that. <laughs> um, yeah, so obviously, you know, he got into Stanford. Um, he also got into Berkeley's double E computer science program, um, which is very impressive, uh, extremely hard to get into. Uh, and for Berkeley, he had to go straight for that major as well, right? Because uh, if you don't go in as a freshman, you basically can't get in in the future. Um, and so I guess obviously a strong candidate, but what, what score would you have? Um, I actually give him a two plus. Yeah. Would recommend it. I would also give a two plus. Um, generally, you know, for context, one is uh, ideal is extremely hard to get. It's really kind of your one in a million candidates with like very specific uh, qualities and, and also achievements. Um, two plus, I would actually for Yale uh, recommend this person to get a likely letter as well. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, this is kind of a letter pre-admissions where you'll say you'll probably get in, and they're uh, they're generally pretty specific. So the letter will be like a STEM likely, or a leadership likely, or like a journalism, um, and it'll be because um, the specific programs, the, um, the the leaders of the deans of those programs really want the student to come that way. So I would recommend this for a STEM likely. Yeah, so really, really strong profile. Um, obviously, not everyone will be able to do all the competitions, but I think it gives a lot of examples about the elements that we can pull and use for ourselves as well. One thing I want to add as well, because this question might come up, well, is two plus enough to be, to be admitted, right? Like, um, I don't know if this person was admitted, but 
Now, two plus is not a guaranteed admission either. Right? There's a lot of students that are two or two plus, and really all it means is it goes to a committee and the level and the strength of that recommendation. The committee ultimately will have to put them in context with other students. Uh, so two plus will not guarantee admission, but it's a pretty strong recommendation. Yeah, I guess on that note, um, piggybacking off that, um, you know, Taiwan itself doesn't get that many admits into all the top schools. Um, so maybe you know, where Stanford only take two students a year from all of Taiwan. So if that application pool one year has like 50 students, I'll have two pluses, right? Then it becomes very difficult to get in, even with a very good score. Um, so let's go into case study number four, AT. Um, AT is a little bit more different, um, a little more humanities based. Uh, so she went to Kutai. Um, so it's a Buddhist boarding school in Nanto, for those who are not familiar. A very unique school system. Uh, she had a 4.3 out of 4.0 weighted GPA, so still pretty good grades. SAT score a little bit lower, uh, 680 on English and 790 for math. Um, and then a wide array of AP scores, mostly five, some fours, and a one three in chemistry. Her major was focused around public policy, economics, social sciences. Um, and for honors and awards, she also had research published internationally. She was honorable mention for the Linguistics Olympiad, um, and then had also a top three in the national calligraphy and essay writing. So kind of a wide range of honors and awards there. Um, her resume looks a little bit different, um, but you guys should also have this in the handout. Uh, she was uh, she did a lot of work inside the school with the Model United Nations and the Spanish Cultural Club. Um, she also started her own personal project as well, uh, the Vita Inspiration Project. Uh, so also another independent project that we're seeing here. Um, yeah, what do you guys think about this student? Um, if we can go back a slide real quick. I think just work. <laughs> so uh, I think what struck me a little bit was, you know, this person uh, had a very clear interest in linguistics, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Um, but then, you know, looking at the English test score on the SAT, this this is a little bit on the lower end, I think, especially for someone so interested, uh, kind of in the linguistics and language aspect. So that was a little bit unexpected, but it's still within range. And I think uh, her activities. Uh, they do kind of support each other, right? You do see, you see Spanish, you see other kind of activities. Um, and then you know, the, the person obviously is also interested in communication, modern imaginations, and things like that. Um, I think for me, it's hard, it's hard for me to find kind of the aha moment for this for the student. Um, it's hard for me to point out and say, well, this student is a blank student, right? Like, how do I summarize the student in one or two senses? And I'm having a little bit of a hard time with that. Yeah, I agree with, you know, your academic assessment. I think one thing I wanted to point out, so if you look here, right, um, it doesn't seem like the student ha has a lot of involvement that is four years, and I think that's something we look for, right? So I think even with the um, independent project, it started in July and then ended in November of the same year, right? I think, you know, longevity is also really important. We want to see our student being able to start something and being able to commit it to it, right? Um, and then here's similar right fun drive from July 2020 to September 2020. Um, so I think I, I wanted to see a little bit more of longevity in all of her activities. And similar, um, I couldn't really pinpoint a point of excellence, right? And this seems like the student is interested in like a variety of subjects, which is really great, but I wish you would have narrowed it down a little bit more, right? So even um, if we're looking at public policy economics, right? So what exactly in public policy are you interested in, right? Um, you know, are you curious about, you know, policy related to language and how we regulate that? You know, I think her um, her resume and, and what she's interested in um, in her activity didn't really show. Oh, yeah, so I think one thing that they're, you know, they've talked a lot about at this point um, is like in terms of the activities, having the longevity. So that's something definitely to emphasize, you know, starting early and planning early for that. Um, and in terms of having the aha moment or the point of excellence, um, there's going to be a lot of issue for Taiwanese students because maybe their school takes up so much of their time, right? Or the school has a lot of activities that are required. Um, and when everyone in school sees the same activity, it's really hard to stand out and have something that differentiates yourself. Um, and so when that happens, you know, a lot of times we have to put in maybe a little bit more effort during the summer or the weekends to really create something different um, for your profile. Uh, one question regarding the academics, you know, um, we, we do see the three on the AP exam for chemistry. Um, does that negatively affect her or what would be your thoughts? 
Yeah, I think for us, um, it wouldn't really negatively affect her profile. Um, I think she's letting us know that she had taken a class in chemistry and she didn't really apply to like a STEM major anyway, so it, didn't, it doesn't really matter which one. Uh, yeah, I would agree as well. I think um, you know, some context about Yale, we have this curriculum where you have to kind of generally spread your study around, right? You have to do like a science and a social science and humanities, but it doesn't have to be a specific course. So even though the chemistry is a three, the biology is a four, uh, and you know she has math scores that are pretty good. So it shows that she does have kind of the more STEM type of uh, capabilities that she can do the coursework, even though the chemistry is a three, and I think depending on the circumstance, the three actually might uh, be a positive because it shows that she's willing to stretch, right? Chemistry might not be, uh, I don't know the whole, the whole transcript, but you know, she might be stretching in trying a new area of studies, uh, in which case, you know, we do like to see the students uh, have the courage to do that, even if the result is not good. And then let's take a look at the essays as well. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think the student also talked a lot about her extracurricular activity in her essay. Um, she talks about the idea of privilege, right? And one of the privilege that she talked about is the ability to be accepted by the people around you. And she talked a lot about how, you know, through her volunteering, she had met people, you know, um, who, who don't really have a community that accept them, right? And how she wants to, um, she created this nonprofit to be able to inspire these people. Um, so I think, and how she hopes to do that in the future. Um, and while the essay is great, I think it was also a lot of telling for me. And also, you know, I couldn't really figure out what she was curious about. What questions is she trying to answer? What kind of thing is, um, you know, what kind of problem do you want to solve in the future, right? Even with this question about privilege, right? How is she going to tackle that with an education at Stanford, per se? Uh, so, yeah, I, I would probably agree um, as well. I think uh, it's, it's kind of a tough topic to talk about. And I think there is a lot of uh, telling and not showing. And I think for me, the question at the end of the day is so what, right? Like you did this activity, you uh, basically uh, gave more empathy uh, and you know, some more worldly understanding. But you know, how did that change how you live your life? How did that change how you interact with the community? And how would you carry that through? And how would a uh, education ideal, for example, help you do those things? And that doesn't really come through. The other thing I think that was really challenging for me was it was really meandering. So while I read through this whole thing, it was not really clear to me what uh, the student was trying to say. Um, they were kind of all over the board in terms of uh, how they, they were describing their activities. I couldn't really tell how that first uh, bit about privilege tied to uh, more of the conclusion um, of that essay, right? And so it, it, you know, tying back to kind of that first student, it felt like they had a topic that they really wanted to write about, and then they try to force uh, force that essay to to um, into those constraints rather than you know write an essay about something that they were truly passionate about. And then lastly, if you look at the rest of the application, you know, there's a lot of linguistics awards with declared interest in policy, and now there's this essay that doesn't seem to quite really fit the application. So it causes more confusion. So at the end of you know, all of these essays we've had you can emphasize again, you know, essays are really important, right? So spend a lot of time thinking about it, a lot of time thinking about how do you package it with the rest of your profile. Actually, I want to piggyback off you this time. <laughs> so, so if I were to look at the rest of that application without the essay, I think it would actually be like a reasonably strong application. But then when I look at the essay, for me, it actually hurts the application. Yeah. So really making sure we pinpoint you know, the right topics and the right essay. Um, that being said, the student still got into some great schools, right? So the student got into Georgetown and then Yale NUS. Uh, Yale NUS does not exist anymore. RIP, Yale NUS. Um, <laughs> but uh, she is at Georgetown and did very well out there. Um, so in terms of uh, scores, like, what would you guys think? Uh, I think I would give the student a three. Um, I think the student would be able to succeed at Yale, would survive, but I don't know that the student would thrive. And then the other question would be, I'm not sure what the student was referring to the community. So when we admit students, we think a lot about that. Uh, what kind of community are we building and how does the student fit in? Yeah, I would also give the three. Um, I think the intellectual vitality part wasn't very clear for me and there was no clear point of excellence. Yeah, so I mean, hearing all of these students, um, 
you know, even for the three students who did not get, you know, twos or then to Stanford or Yale, um, they still got to pretty amazing schools, right? So they still got points of three, right? Which would get them to Georgetown, Michigan, Berkeley, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, for all of you guys out there, you know, the what the schools look for are different as well. So we've heard a little bit about how Yale and Stanford are different, but really every university is going to be kind of different. Um, so it can be also pretty useful to start pinpointing your dream school now, right? Um, and start thinking about what that school cares about um, and really crafting their profile in that way too. Um, yeah, so after going through those, um, thank you, Dan and Alan. Uh, we want to give everyone time to ask questions as well, um, whether it's about you know, the admissions office um, or just applications in general. Um, can you feel free to use you know, Chinese or English? Uh, does anyone have any questions? Well-roundedness seems to be really important in class admission. However, like for an like, applicant, if they have the warrant to like think they're really into it, and that's the way to their major, or do you prefer student with like four or five interests in total and like pretty well-rounded, but the cover a lot of aspects? Which one do you prefer? So what well, else? I think um, the question I'm going to answer slightly differently. It's not really like a, a strict dichotomy. I think more importantly, speaking for Yale, is the depth of your passion. So if you have four or five things that you're really interested in, how do you show that on your application? It becomes very difficult because you only have 10 slots to put your activities, you only have five slots for awards, you only have so many essays, so how do you show it this way? And so I think that for a well-rounded student with four or five activities, uh, I would choose one or two that I would focus on and really emphasize, right? So like points of excellence for Stanford, uh, how to, um, aha moments I get, right? Like when I look at the student, I need to be able to remember the student and then be able to summarize the student in one or two sentences. So how do I do that for someone uh, who doesn't create an application that helps facilitate them? Um, you have to remember also, you know, when you're going through like 30, 40,000 applications, each student on the first read probably only gets 15 minutes, something like that. So you really have to make it really easy for the admissions officer uh, or the reader to figure out like who are you and to get the right. <laughs> now um, back there. Are interviews really important also to admission? Yeah, um, I can answer. Um, so at Stanford, um, as admission officer and reader, we do not conduct interview. So most of our interview are actually done by our alumni. So, um, you know, I think similarly, you know, we train them on reviewing for SPIF or intellectual vitality and um, self-perception from the student. Um, I think that oftentimes it can be a conversation, right, for, for alumni to really share about Stanford, answer any of the questions you have, and then also for the alum, alum to really learn about you, right? Um, I think that sometimes, you know, I would say interviews can harm you more than it can um, it can help you, right? So I think what we're looking for when we review interview notes is whether or not what you're saying is aligned, right? So what you're presenting to the alum, is it aligning with the information that you are putting on the application, right? Is there any other detail that you can put on the application, but through your interview, we can learn more about you, right? But if you go and meet with an interviewer and you know they ask, do you have any question about Stanford? And you're like, no, <laughs> right? Um, that doesn't really give me a lot of um, a sense that you're interested, right? Or if you show up late, um, those type of things can also really harm you. So I would say um, interview is really important, but it's not the deciding factor. It's just one thing that can influence um, our perception. Follow up is our interviews optional then, or is it something that you? If you are, yeah, um, I actually would recommend if you're able to, um, please meet, please prepare and do an interview. Um, I think while it is optional, not everyone get an interview, I think it's a good opportunity for students to showcase who they are, um, not on paper. 1000% agree with everything Ben said. Um, one thing uh, I want to plan for is also uh, on the topic of not everyone gets an interview because you might not have someone who can interview you. That will not be held against you. But if you're offered an interview and you decline it, um, you know, that's not going to help you either. Uh, I also want to point out, just really emphasize that the interviews really can hurt. And it's rare that an interview will actually really help you, uh, but it's more common that it'll hurt you. And so really what it comes down to ideal is you're going to have a lot of twos and two plus students, right? So how, how can you differentiate that? 
And so when we think about uh, the two factors, right, can you do the coursework and then who are you? Um, a lot of the time, your application might not come through with everything. So if you can show up well to your interview, that, that will help that will help uh, your your admissions officer better understand you, especially if you have a good conversation with your officer. Um, having done a lot of interviews too, a big a big pitfall, just like Andrew, sorry, Andy, is students will come and just list their achievements, or they'll talk about their resume, and they won't engage with the interviewer. The interviewer doesn't really care about that, right? Often we don't even get your resume, and uh, we, we don't we don't care. We we took care less. We just want to know who you are as a person. Uh, so that list of seven qualities, that's what we're looking for. Can you express yourself, right? Uh, do you have passion? Um, do you care about you know, the community and your school and, and, and all of those non, uh, those more, more soft factors as we go? Yeah, so one thing that they mentioned, um, some of you might be thinking, oh, if they can really harm you, why would you still recommend that you do the interview, right? Um, I think for a lot of these top schools, uh, there's just so many great chances, so many twos and two pluses. Any chance you have to, sometimes just have to take a risk, right? Um, in order to try and make yourself stand out a bit. I would add a note. So at Stanford now, I think you also have to um, submit. You have to, at some school, you have the ability to submit um, a video instead of like having an interview. So the same thing also applies to that. Right? I think don't repeat all the things that you already have listed on your application. Um, really trying to tell us and show us who you are, and you have this chance of showing us your face, right, and who you are. So please use that. Thing. Yeah. Oh, we got a question. Yeah, we got questions from parents uh, from the Dubai. And I think uh, does uh, Asian boys have the less chances to get in, or any prefer any preference about the nationalities or genders about the different majors, something like that. Thank you. Yeah. So, plus, is is it harder for Asian boys to get in? Uh, yeah. It's not yeah. Race, it's so demographics. Uh, it's what they want. They want to know. Yeah. Thank you. So. Uh, I'll again answer this maybe a little indirectly. Um, so for Yale, it's about building the community, right? So it's not necessarily about race, but more about uh, what are you doing? And so I think Andy touched on this earlier, which is um, Asians, especially Asian boys, tend to do similar things, right? You're in a computer science, you're into math, you're really good at some of these more STEM-based activities, and maybe you're not doing as much humanities or some other uh, elements of involvement. So you know, while there have been, I'll, I'll openly acknowledge this, some scandals, right, around um, kind of ethnicity, I think more broadly it's about how is that community being built? And so as an Asian boy or Asian in general, right, you want to consider how can you, uh, going back again to that aha moment, that point of excellence, how can you stand out among your peers, right? Why would they take you over the person sitting next to you uh, when you're all 1600 SAT, right? Like, you know, math, gold medalist, et cetera. Like what, what's going to make you stand out? So uh, going back to your question, I don't think it's about uh, your ethnicity uh, or, or gender. It's more about, you know, what, what are you doing with your life? Okay. okay. Any <laughs> questions about uh, the uh, parents from Tibet? And they want to know, so how about the views about a gap year and uh, the internship, something like that? Yeah, this yeah. is a different question, sorry. Yeah, um, I'll answer the question about that. Yep, yep. Yeah, thank you. So I think for us at Stanford, um, you know, I think we view gap year as, so, okay, so you're telling me you have to bring gap year, what have you done, right? And how have you used that opportunity of that time and energy to explore what you're interested in, right? Did you use that time to really strengthen your profile, right? Did you use that time, let's say you say you're interested in sociology, right? Did you use that time to, you know, explore a research project in your community, right? And if you have taken that gap year, but you haven't done anything, right? Um, we also want to know why. Right. Why you haven't taken that gap year? Did something happen in your family that required you to do so? Right. I think I often tell folks that, you know, tell us more, right? If you say that you can't actually, you know, need to take a gap year because you have to work to take care of your family or you have to take off so you, a family member is sick. We want to know those things, right? We're not here to like fail you. We want to know as much information as possible to help you. Can I agree more? I guess I'll take the internship question. So uh, thematically, it's very similar. So it's more about what are you doing? Why did you take that internship? Right? What, what did you do with that internship? Um, your your the goal of the the reader is basically understand you. So if you just took a random internship, right, it, it should be supported by the rest of your um, rest of your application. 
So it should be supported by your other awards, your curriculars. Um, you know. So I think at the end of the day, it's not about the specific activity, but how your entire application ties together. And does that tell a cohesive story? Yeah, on the note of internships, I just also want to add that um, it's not how impressive the company sounds either. Right. So maybe you know, like a manager at Google and you go help out, you can't really do anything. Um, then that's not necessarily helpful either. Right. So uh, really focusing in on what you can actually do in the internship and achieve uh, is also really important. Thank you. Um yeah, so I want to ask about the class rigor you mentioned at the very beginning. And um so I go to the local school and um I found it a little bit harder. For me to kind of like try to stand out among others uh, kids that go to international school so like what are the ways or like opportunities that i can try to like highlight or like kind of just to um mention about oh our our school does have um rigorous classes and they aren't like uh like easier or like um like what's the what's the extent but what, what are the measures that i could do to I like to the mission officers that oh our school does have difficult classes but like they're not APs we don't have the uh, opportunity to choose the difficulties but they are really like hard or something yeah. like that yeah thank you for um, asking that yeah I think that's um that's where context becomes really important right so um you know I think when you apply you can also submit a school profile um and then that's where you know you get to um, tell us hey actually. Uh, our school don't provide AP or IB or a local school, but this is, you know, um, in our, this is our math curriculum, right? And really telling us what your school offers, right? And I also want to, you know, um, talk about self-studying for AP class, uh, for AP tests or taking classes at your local community college to be able to really show us that actually, even though there's no resources at school to take AP or IB, I am taking the initiative to be able to pursue those things. Um, and I think that really tell me that you are committed to your education. Mm -hmm. Does that answer? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I just want to say one thing. I love telling this story um, because I think it gives a lot of context of uh, how you looks at things. So um, I had a classmate from Alaska, so kind of not necessarily the greatest school system. And this person actually applied with like a 2.6 or 2.8 GPA. Uh, test scores were okay, nothing you know, really spectacular. But they taught themselves 16 languages. And so they were fluent in 16 languages and they submitted a supplementary uh, you know, recording of them speaking these languages, right? And so that's something where you know this person, while they knew their weaknesses academically, or maybe that just was not what they're interested in, they did find something they were really passionate about and really dove into that. So you know, I think uh, for me, when you asked your question, what's that was how can I stand out compared to these other schools? And I think there's a lot of ways you can do that um, without having to necessarily compete along traditional lines. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, any other questions? Okay. Anything online? Oh, yes. Uh, I think the parents want to know about a, a summer camp or something like the contest. If they can't join the Olympics contest, it would be helpful or as much as they can. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, regarding summer programs, actually quite a few of those students did summer programs. There's like the Berkeley Pre-College and MIT Swatch X. Uh, yeah, so, so you guys could get some contacts on how summer programs play. So to be honest, uh, for Yale, they don't really matter very much um, because usually they're basically like a course, right? So the best that I can say for them is it shows uh, your interest in that topic because you went to a camp for that topic. A more general summer camp would really not help you. I would much rather see you get involved in your community. If you want to do math more, maybe you're going to community center and you're teaching math. If you want to do physics more, maybe you're kind of building your own model rockets or something like that. Something like that to me would should, uh, be more memorable, would show that uh, you as a student have initiative, uh, if you have a passion that you're following as compared to uh, just a camp. That said, some camps I think are really valuable, but it really depends on the camp, what you do with that camp and then how you showcase that on the application. Yeah, I think similarly at Stanford, you know, I'll say one thing, but, you know, if you get into a very prestigious summer program that you have to, you know, it's very competitive to get in, right? Um, like math camp at MIT per se, right? And those type of things, it definitely boosts your profile, right? And really telling me, actually, you're very competitive, right? And you have some things to pursue your interest, even though you're going out of your way to do so. Yeah, so I think in terms of summer camps, basically, 
the easier it is to get into the camp, the less it helps, right? So the prestigious ones, the admission rate are all very low as well. Um, you know, for research, MIT's RSI has a 2% admission rate or something. So even harder to get into than some of the top schools. Um, but if you do get into those camps, then it's like sort of winning the Olympiad or like winning a competition. Um, so it really depends on the program. Uh, but most pre-college programs, we just pay to go, um, like I was saying, probably doesn't help as much. Yeah, any other last questions? All right. Well, uh, you know, we did go over a lot today. I know some of you guys might be shy about you know, asking questions from such a large group. Uh, so if you guys have any questions that are more one-on-one, -on -one, uh, feel free to reach out to any of the panel staff here today. They're in white t-shirts. Um, we'll also still be around here for a little bit longer if you guys want to come up and ask questions too. Uh, we're also happy to you know, talk about any students' specifics as well. Um, if you guys haven't yet, we would appreciate it if you give us some feedback on uh, things you enjoy, things you want to know more about. Um, so please fill that in as well. Um, and yeah, thank you guys so much for coming. Really enjoyed having you guys. Thank you guys.